One of the TV shows that I'm watching at the moment uh, is Superman and Lois. Uh, it's all about middle-aged Superman who is married to Lois Lane and has teenage boys and all the sort of the joys that uh, he has trying to save the world while raising teenage boys. Now, uh, some of you might remember the mission statement of Superman. Uh, he wages a never-ending fight for truth, justice and the American way. But you know that in recent times, Superman's mission statement has changed. It is now truth, justice and a better tomorrow. Ah, you might be wondering why. I have no idea why. Uh, it could be that the makers of Superman think that uh, maybe America and truth and justice are not quite aligned anymore. Maybe. Or it might be that uh, the makers of Superman uh, want Superman to appeal to people in countries where Americans are not really liked. And so they kind of diminish the American sort of part of it and it's all about a better tomorrow now. Now, the reason why I tell you this, uh, first of all, so you know I like superhero TV shows and movies, uh, but secondly, to introduce these concepts of truth and justice. Truth and justice. For they are at the heart of the ninth of the Ten Commandments that we're looking at today. Uh, indeed, friends, God gave the ninth commandment because truth is essential for justice to occur. Uh, the ninth commandment being... You shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. Now, when people often think about the ninth commandment, they think it says you shall not lie. Uh, you shall not lie is a very sort of broad uh, kind of idea. Uh, that is, you shall not, shall not speak falsely in any kind of context. But there is a particular context in mind with this commandment. And friends, it is the context of the law court. You shall not bear false testimony in the court of law against your neighbour. Uh, we saw from our first reading from the book of Deuteronomy that uh, eyewitness testimony was essential when it came to actually convicting a person of a crime. And one eyewitness wasn't enough. You needed two or three eyewitnesses. Remember that back in those days, there's no sort of fingerprinting going on, no DNA sort of uh, evidence that is able to be kind of used, eyewitness testimony was essential when it came to deciding court cases. And so the ninth commandment is saying to people, if you are a witness in a court case, do not give false testimony against your neighbour. Why? Well, if they are innocent of a crime and you say they are guilty, they will be punished unjustly if they are convicted on the basis of your testimony. Now, friends, even though Deuteronomy uh, 19 says you've got to have two or three witnesses to put someone to death, that wasn't necessarily a guarantee that people would be spared the death penalty. Indeed, if you have a look at 1 Kings 21, 1 Kings 21, there's a man named Naboth who is put to death on the basis of false testimony given by two scurrilous men. This commandment, friends, is given so that those who are innocent will be protected, so that justice will be done. But friends, this uh, commandment doesn't just apply to courts of law, it can also apply to the court of public, opi uh, public opinion. Uh, slander is a, a form of lying where you spread false rumours about someone, someone who is of good character, so that in the eyes of others, they have a good name no more. But it can also occur in the court of the household. Ever been blamed for something by a sibling that you didn't do and got into trouble for it? Or have you ever blamed one of your siblings for something you did and got them into trouble for it? I see lots of smirks going on in the congregation at this point. Well, the Ninth Commandment speaks against that too. Friends, there is a strong connection here between truth and justice. For justice to occur, truth needs to be spoken. That's what this commandment's all about. 
And we see in our first reading from Deuteronomy 19 that God wanted very serious action to be taken against those who broke this commandment. I'll read again. If a malicious witness takes the stand to accuse someone of a crime, the two people involved in the dispute must stand in the presence of the Lord before the priests and the judges who are in office at the time. The judges must make a thorough investigation. And if the witness proves to be a liar, giving false testimony against a fellow Israelite, then do to the false witness as that witness intended to do to the other party. You must purge the evil from among you. So if uh, you really hate the person who's on trial and the crime that they're accused of is going to lead to them receiving the death penalty and you give false testimony against them, then what this is saying is, if it's discovered that you have given false testimony, you should receive the death penalty. God wanted the evil purged from amongst the Israelites. Friends, our God is a righteous God. He loves justice. And this ninth commandment was all about making sure that the truth was spoken so that justice would be done. But friends, it's not just false testimony that can lead to injustice. Uh, have a look at uh, Leviticus 5 verse 1. We read, If anyone sins because they do not speak up, when they hear a public charge to testify regarding something they have seen or learned about, they will be held responsible. Uh, this verse is sort of uh, describing a situation where a person is on trial and they are innocent and you know that they are innocent and a call goes out for people to testify about this person and you think, no, I'm not going to testify. Even though they're innocent, I don't want them to get off. A failure to testify can also lead to injustice. Now, friends, the sad truth is that the people of Israel were not very good at keeping the ninth commandment. And Lee, listen to what Isaiah 59 says about what Israel would become. The Israelites are addressed, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt. And I take it when it's talking about fingers with guilt, it's talking about the finger that points at someone and says you have done wrong, even though they are innocent. Your lips are spoken falsely and your tongue mutters wicked things. No one calls for justice. No one pleads a case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments. They utter lies. They conceive trouble and give birth to evil. And then in verses 14 to 15, so justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The people were not speaking truthfully. They were not keeping the ninth commandment. And so the result was that Israel became this unjust society. Uh, so committed to injustice that those who were innocent now became prey who were hunted. How would you like to live in a society like that? Doesn't sound very good, does it? A society where injustice just abounds. You see, friends, when God gives commandments, he's not a party pooper. He's not trying to make our life bad. He gives us commandments so our lives flourish. And when he says, speak the truth in matters of law, he's doing it so justice abounds because justice is good for us. It's good for us to live in a just society. But I despair that truth is being devalued in our society at the moment that people are not prizing it as much as they ought. Uh, we hear about spin occurring uh, lots and lots, don't we, in our society? Uh, I once heard a representative of a government overseas uh, being put under the, the, the grill, if you like, by a journalist who was presented with facts uh, that showed that the leader that they were representing uh, was acting wrongly and 
the leader's spokesperson, uh, without any hesitation, said, oh, but there are alternative facts. Alternative facts. See, friends, when you have a situation where truth is being devalued, the result will always be that justice will go out the window. That's what happens. When truth goes out the window, justice follows closely by. When God gave this commandment, friends, he gave it for the flourishing of his people because people flourish when truth and justice abound. Now, at this point, some might think, okay, so God is saying that it's not right for us to lie if it's going to cause an injustice. Does that mean that it's okay to lie if injustice will not be the result? Well, what we see as we look at the rest of the Bible is that God hates lying in all circumstances. Uh, so look at verses uh, 17 to 20 of Proverbs 6. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Seven things that God hates, and notice that two of them speak about lying. God hates lying. Proverbs 12, our second reading, talked about how God detests lying lips. God detests lying lips. In fact, God detests lies so much that he will punish lies. Have a look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. We read, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And the second death that's being referred to here is what we would call hell. Notice who will be in hell. All liars. All liars. Now, just to make sure we're on the same page here, let me just uh, talk about uh, what lying involves. So a person with a lying tongue makes a claim that something isn't true when it is, or that something is true when it isn't. Okay, so that's just the bold-faced lie. But there are some sort of variations on this too. So a person with a lying tongue distorts the truth by exaggerating it or minimizing it. So, you know, the old fisherman talks about how they caught the fish, telling the truth, but it was that big rather than that big, okay? So that's a distortion of the truth by exaggerating the truth, trying to make the person look like a better fisherman. Or when it comes to minimizing the truth, we tend to minimize things that we don't want people to know about us so much. So, you know, oh, I, I failed an exam, mum and dad, but it wasn't by much. You know, now when a mum and dad hears that, they think, okay, maybe my kid got 49 out of 100, 48, and the kid actually got 30. But it wasn't by much, only 20. What's 20? It's not much. You know, that's a kind of a, a minimizing of the truth. It's a distortion of the truth, right? That's lying. So too is making promises or oaths that you know that you can't or won't keep. Um, Tradies can fall into this one, can't they? If you're a tradie, I love you. I'm sure you're nice. I'm sure you tell the truth. I hope you do anyway. Um, but quite often, and I know this from speaking with uh, friends who are tradies, you know, customers are badgering them. And just to kind of make the peace, they make a promise. And in their minds, they think, I have no idea how on earth I'm going to do that. But I'll just make the promise to get them off my back. Or we have people who run for office who promise all sorts of things knowing full well that they will never ever actually do what they've said they'll do. That's lying. Okay? So a person with a lying tongue does these things. And what have we heard about what God thinks about the lying tongue? He detests it. He hates it. He hates it. 
Friends, lying doesn't just bring about injustice. It also damages relationships, doesn't it? It it, it breaks down trust. Uh, When you know someone is lying to you, it it kind of makes it hard to actually believe anything they say again. It impacts relationships in that kind of way. It's not good. It actually causes significant harm. And so, given that lying can bring about injustice, given that lying can actually damage relationships, given that God actually detests lying, given that lying is a sin that actually will cause a person to go to hell, why on earth do people lie? Why? Well, a person with a lying tongue is normally motivated by things like pride. Okay, so the fisherman exaggerates about their catch or the person who's failed the exam minimizes the truth why so that they look better to others than what they actually are pride is the motive there Uh, so too can fear be the motive we have witness protection programs don't we Uh, why because well there are people who are going to testify in a court case And there are other people who say, if you testify in the court case and if you uh, speak against my person, I'll have you killed. And that fear of losing your life or suffering in some kind of way can prompt you to not testify truthfully. Uh, Malice. So I really don't like that person and uh, everyone seems to like them. So I'm going to spread slander about them to actually diminish their name so that people won't like them anymore comes out of a malicious heart. Uh, Greed, quite often people won't testify about the truth because they've been bribed and so their love of money, their love of material things overpowers their love of justice but also a lust for power and this is where our politicians in particular come into play, don't they? In their desire for power, they will tell lies, or in their desire to keep power, they will tell lies. All of this is quite self-centred, isn't it? All of this is actually quite unloving. Again, another reason why God hates lies. But some of you might come back and say, but Mark, aren't there situations where it actually is loving to lie? You know, the old white lie? Ah, you look great in that, sweetheart. You know, I I, I tell a lie to spare the feelings of my loved one. Well, what about situations where my speaking the truth could actually lead to one I love or just to another person being harmed in some kind of way? Uh, We actually have an example of that in the book of Joshua. So in Joshua chapter 2, Uh, The people of Israel are about to uh, enter into the promised land. They're about to cross the Jordan River. But before they do so, Joshua sends two spies to go and spy out the land. And the two spies come to a town called Jericho. And in Jericho, they meet a woman named Rahab. And Rahab allows them to stay at her place. Listen to what happens after this. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. Well, anyway, uh, soldiers are sent to go and look for these spies. Uh, Rahab extracts a promise from these spies that uh, when the Israelites do conquer Jericho, that she and her family will be spared. And then she sends them off in a different direction to where the soldiers had gone so that the spies would be okay. Was it right for Rahab to lie to the king of Jericho to spare the lives of these spies? It's interesting what the book of James has to say about Rahab. In chapter 2, verse 25, we read, In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute 
considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. Rahab was considered to be righteous. But was she considered righteous for her lie? It's interesting, the lie is not actually mentioned in this verse, is it? What's mentioned is the fact that she willingly gave uh, lodging to the spies. What's also explicitly mentioned is the fact that she sent the spies off in a different direction to the soldiers. But there's no explicit mention here of her lie. Was Rahab right to lie in this situation? A helpful answer to this question uh, is one that I found uh, in the work of J.I. Packer, a uh, well-known theologian, and this is what he had to say about situations like that of Rahab. He said, to bear false witness for one's neighbour, for one's neighbour, is not so bad as bearing false witness against him. But the lie as such, however necessary it appears, is bad, not good. And the right-minded man knows this. Rightly, he will feel defiled. Rightly, he will seek fresh cleansing in the blood of Christ and settle for living the only way anyone can live with our holy God, by the forgiveness of sins. Again, we say, Lord, have mercy and lead us not into this particular type of temptation where only a choice of sins seems open to us, but deliver us from evil. Uh, notice the Packer is really saying that Rahab's speaking false testimony for these spies is not as bad as speaking falsely against someone. But notice that he says it's still bad anyway. Why does he say that? Well, he knows, as we all do, that God hates lying. God detests lies. Indeed, uh, friends, we've got to be really, really careful that we don't sort of start uh, using a form of ethics calls called the ends justifies the means. So, you know, okay, uh, I need to tell a lie so that this person's life is spared, okay? So the fact that the person's life is spared justifies me telling the lie. That's, that's the way that kind of ethics works. And we've got to be careful about this, friends, because God actually does care about the means, God actually does hate lies. And friends, could it be that the reason why we feel the need to lie in such a situation is because we're not trusting in the wisdom or the sovereignty or the goodness of God to deliver the outcome that we think is the right one? So this is a real rubber hitting the road sort of scenario in terms of faith, isn't it? God says, live this way. My living this way could have this outcome. Do I trust in God to bring about that outcome by doing what is right? It would be an awful situation to be in, wouldn't it? And so I, I totally pray the prayer that uh, Packer prays at the end. Spare us uh, from such temptations where sin seems to be the only way out. Deliver us from that evil. But friends, God detests lying. He hates lying in all of its forms. And as we uh, meditate upon what lying actually is, are we not all caught up in this sin? Are we not all caught up in it? We all exaggerate or minimise. We all make promises we can't or won't keep. There are times where we just say things that blatantly aren't true and claim that they are true or vice versa. We all do that. Remember what the punishment is? All lies will endure the second death, hell. Does that mean if we've told lies that we're all now heading for hell? Well, we come to our third point, which is that in Jesus we find the truth that sets us free from the punishment we deserve for our lies. Uh, look at John 1.14, we read, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
Uh, here we are told that Jesus is full of grace and truth. Um, Jesus is God. Hebrews 6 says it's impossible for God to lie. Jesus is the one who is fully truthful. But when it says that Jesus is full of truth, it's saying more than he is just fully truthful. It's also saying he reveals truth. Uh, notice he's called the Word. John's Gospel refers to Jesus as the Word. He is the Word of God. He is the Word who reveals God the Father to us. Uh, the, the words that Jesus speaks are the words that his Father speaks. The great signs that Jesus performs are signs that are powered by his Father and reveal his Father's power. Jesus comes into the world to reveal the truth about God. But not just the truth about how we can know God, but also the truth about how we can be right with God, even though we're sinners. Look at John 8, 31 to 36. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a song belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Notice that Jesus says, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And everyone who is a slave to sin deserves punishment from God. They deserve that second death that Revelation 21 speaks of. But notice what Jesus is saying here. He's saying that he reveals truth which can set people free from slavery to sin, which can set people free not only uh, from the punishment that sin deserves, but also provide something much better to come. But what is this truth that Jesus is saying we need to accept if we want to be free from slavery to sin and the punishment that comes with it? Well, in John 3, 14 to 16, Jesus gives us this teaching when he says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Uh, Jesus talks about Moses lifting up a snake in the wilderness. Uh, in Numbers chapter 21, Numbers 21, the Israelites were grumbling against God and God sent snakes into the camp. And the snakes go into the camp and start biting people and people start dying. And the Israelites cry out for help. And God gets Moses to construct a snake on a pole. And he says, if people are bitten by the snake and they look at that pole, they will live. So Moses constructs a snake, the people are bitten, they look at the pole and they live. And Jesus uses this Old Testament story as an illustration to describe something else. Notice he says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. What's he talking about there? He's talking about the death on the cross that he would endure. A death where he, the innocent one, took upon himself our guilt and the punishment that we all deserve. And what's Jesus saying? Well, just as those who looked at the snake who believed in God's promise would live, so now if we look to Jesus, the crucified one, if we acknowledge that he died for us and took the punishment we deserve, if we look to him and recognise that trusting in him will bring us eternal life, then we will indeed receive that eternal life. By rights, we deserve the second death. But God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life as we look to him. 
Friends, our lies deserve death. But the truth that Jesus reveals gives us life. Praise Jesus for doing that. Praise God for his love for us. That even though we do things that he detests, that he gave his one and only son to make it possible for us to have life. Friends, God wants us to flourish. He gives us commands so that we will flourish. He tells us to speak the truth so that justice will abound, so that relationships will be preserved. But we've failed to do that. We deserve punishment, but we praise God that through Jesus we have forgiveness. And friends, our forgiveness doesn't now give us the excuse just to lie, knowing we'll be forgiven. No, we are now to be committed to speaking the truth, following the example of our Saviour, who only speaks truth.